Well, welcome to the Neighborhood Church. We're so glad that you've joined us today for our service. We're going to be starting a new series called Save People, Serve People. So I'm looking forward to getting into that. Worship's in progress, so why don't we head out here? Oh 
falling rain like waters rise and flood this place we reach for you we cling for you oh lord we be old the fallen rain like waters rise and flood this place we reach for you we cling to you oh Kickoff Saturday. How many of people remember going to kickoff Sunday in 1984? I'm only doing this because Jacqueline specifically asked me not to do it. She said she'd be embarrassed. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me, Lord, just in time. I'm going to praise his name. Each day is just the same. I'm going to praise him. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. <laughs> Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. All right, now just Jacqueline. Welcome to kickoff Sunday, Saturday. We just made Pastor John's week. He's probably now going to start in his sermon talking about his Israel trip in 1986, where he bought a nice Christmas knit native, what are they called? Those and that thing he left at the church in Portage, the, the Last Supper. Remember you bought that? Those are the days. Welcome to church, everyone. Well, now for some family news. I just want to mention to any of our guests today who are joining us about our Connect card. You can fill it out online at our website. If there's any way that we can connect you in the community, help you get involved, any questions we can answer, we'd love to chat with you. So just fill that out and one of us will reach out to you. A couple of announcements that I want to make mention of. Two Million Steps for Missions, September 12th to 21st is happening. Last year we did this, we called it a Million Steps for Mission. We're stepping it up this year, right? And so you can get tracking sheets, you can get donation sheets at the information desk or call the office. We'd love to get those in your hands. Also, as always, there's going to be some draws for some new pairs and new balance shoes. And we just encourage you to get out walking and let's support our missionaries this fall. Our weekend of prayer and fasting is happening September 16th to 18th. It'll start Friday night. 
with a meeting at our North Point location at 208 Main Street West in Warman, Saskatchewan. And so we're gonna pray that evening together. We'll also meet and gather at the Pine House location Saturday morning, 10 a.m. And we will also have our weekend services Saturday at six at Pine House, Sunday 11 at Pine House, and Sunday at five at North Point. And so I just encourage you, Come out for that. Let's get together. Let's pray. Let's seek God together. Thank you so much for your giving. Ways to give are now up on the screen. Uh, I just want to encourage you just to continue to remember missions in your giving this month. And uh, just thank you so much for your giving. It's much appreciated. Our memory verse this month is found in the book of Matthew in chapter 23. And so I'm going to read through it with you today. It says, the greatest among you must be a servant. Matthew 23 verse 11. And so at the Neighborhood Church, we value memorizing scripture. And so I just want to encourage you to hide God's word in your heart. Memorize it this week. Join us in that this month as we memorize Matthew 23, 11. At this time, we're going to go back into the service. So let's head on in.
This month we're beginning a series called Save People, Serve People. And as a part of that, we're memorizing our verse. The greatest among you must be a servant. And we're just gonna be talking to a few people about the importance of serving and finding a place of work and ministry uh, within the church. And today I'm honored to have with me uh, Victor. Victor and his wife, Aloysia, and uh, their two children, Jackson and Hannah, uh, moved to Saskatoon in November. And by December, we're uh, attending our church and uh, beginning to become a part of us. So glad you found your way to Saskatoon. Welcome to Canada and welcome to the Neighborhood Church. Uh, tell us a little bit about serving and why serving matters to you when you started to serve. Serving is a privilege. Serving God is a privilege. And I have been into church activities since my grade seven or eight. Wow. And my parents always encourage that. So or let's stop there just for a minute. <laughs> Grade seven, eight, nine, ten, listening in right now, we want your servant already. So keep going, bless you. <laughs> for quite a while, I was thinking serving is kind of uh, something as um, a real sacrifice that you're doing to God. But at one point of the time, I really realized the real meaning of the. So uh, meaning of service, that is, it's a privilege that God gives us. So you mentioned to me when we were chatting that you came here, started attending in December, and, and for two or three, maybe four months there, five months, you weren't really doing anything. How did that feel to you? Did you feel like something was yeah, missing was, in your life? I was really missing something because I was not connected to the, to the church. I was connected to the Lord, of course, and we cannot be without that. And I was not connected to the church and we were just coming in and going out and it was not giving a, a good feeling. But I just had an opportunity, I guess in April, uh, I got this opportunity to serve in the church and I immediately grabbed the opportunity and I, I started working on that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll make two comments there. You were coming, but you didn't feel connected. Uh, Man, we want all of you to feel connected around here. And I think the best way to get connected is to find a place to serve. So what place did you find to serve in, Victor? Yeah, I'm into the uh, audio production team and I'm controlling the soundboard. And uh, I think it's, it gives me a pleasure in that's, uh, that I'm serving the Lord in some or the other way. And you're doing a great job for us. And and, and the reality is working the soundboard is probably one of the most thankless jobs in the church. The only time people ever talk to you is when it's not done right. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think many people are talking to you because you're doing a really good job for us. We, <laughs> we bless comment. you. Thank you for we that. You. Why do you think it's important for others to find a way to serve, to become a part of a team within their church, our church? The least thing that we can do is serving the Lord. And it's a privilege, as I said earlier. So we should serve the Lord in any manner. And my prayers daily will be uh, prepare me to serve you, Lord. It's so important for us to remember how much Jesus did for us. And when we remember that, I don't think it's hard for us to find a way to serve others. So thank you. Thank you, Victor, for giving time to chat about this. Save people, serve, serve people. people. That's for sure. Bless yeah. you. Thank you so much. And tonight we begin the series, the three-week series, Save People, Serve People. So glad you are here to be a part of it. Save people, serve people. I really want us to get this. I really want us to get this. And that's been uh, kind of heavy on my heart this week. 
And then thankfully, I was reminded that that's not my job. But the Holy Spirit is the one who stirs our hearts. And so I'm asking him even now, oh, come Holy Spirit, come. And help us to hear what you're saying to us tonight. In Jesus' name, please, Father. Amen. And amen. A husband and wife were talking, and she uh, came up to her husband who was laying out on the couch and said, I'm, I'm so embarrassed, I'm so ashamed. Uh, we have no money. My uh, mom pays our rent. Um, I have to go out and sometimes beg to make sure we got food. We have no car anytime we need to go anywhere. I have to call my sister. And the whole time all of this is going on, you're just sitting there laying on the couch. I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed. And his response was, you should be ashamed. Your two brothers aren't helping us at all. We live in a culture that has such a spirit of entitlement a culture where we feel like people owe us so much. But that's not really a Christian perspective, unfortunately, however, uh, that has crept into the church. And this sense that we are entitled, we deserve a good church service. I sure hope the band is on tonight. We feel we're entitled to great service, and perhaps we miss sight of the fact that God has called us to serve. Saved people serve people. Saved people serve people. In a culture so widely characterized by entitlement, our world this week lost somebody who, while having a title that entitled her to much, chose to serve. As a 21-year-old, Queen Elizabeth said, I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. She saw herself as a servant. At her jubilee, uh, platinum jubilee, I think they is what they called it, she made this statement. I remain committed to serving you to the best of my ability. Here's a woman from the beginning to the end chose to serve, chose to serve. I think in large part, and by the way, she signed many of her letters, your servant, Elizabeth, your servant, Elizabeth, I think a lot of that was rooted and grounded in her strong faith in Christ. Tonight, I want to challenge you with two ways to serve. Two ways to serve. There's all kinds of ways to serve. We'll talk about the importance of serving more as we make our way through this series as well. But I want to challenge you to two ways to serve. And the first way to serve, uh, no, you got to go way, 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 way 
way ahead here. Uh, slide 14 or so, I think. Uh, two ways uh, to serve, and the first way to serve is with prayer, is in prayer ministry. Prayer ministry, and, and why is it important for us to serve in, uh, in prayer ministry? Because God expects the church to pray. God expects the church, next slide, God expects the church to be a part of active engagement in prayer ministry. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 1. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 1. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. Paul makes some statements in chapter 1 about how to live the Christian life, and then he says, so it was first thing, friends, first things. I urge that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. The simple truth is that prayer is a huge priority in the life of the church. God wants the church to prioritize prayer. Second uh, verse I'd like to look at here is Acts chapter 2 and verse number 42. What did the early church do? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayer and prayers. Friends, and sometimes we don't see this as a way of serving. But friends, we serve our church when we take the ministry of prayer seriously. We serve our church when we take the ministry of prayer seriously. The model of the early church, this church that turned the world upside down, was based on, modeled on being in the place of prayer. So the first way we can serve uh, in this church that I'm going to talk about tonight is prayer. And uh, second reason this matters, second reason this matters is because corporate prayer is a part of discipleship. Disciples came up to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. You see, they'd seen Jesus praying and they wanted to know how to pray. And he said, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Those of you who have been Christians for a period of time, a year or two years, you should already be in a mode where you're deeply concerned about raising up others to follow Jesus and to follow him with a spiritual depth that is uncommon in our culture. And if we're trying to disciple Christians to be strong Christians, prayer is part of that discipleship. So they need to see those of us who call ourselves mature Christians deeply committed to prayer and deeply committed to the place of prayer. They're not going to learn to pray if we think prayer doesn't matter. They're not going to think prayer is important if we call people together to pray and nobody's there. Prayer is part of discipleship. It's part of discipling others to follow God. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one or more, all the more as you see the day approaching. Notice that we're not to neglect meeting together. But do you remember what I just read about what they did when they met together? Oh, they sang songs! Not, mention, not much mention of that. They devoted themselves to fellowship, the Word of God, and to prayer. I'm not coming to pray because there's no guitars there. Mm hmm 
the church needs a strong ministry of prayer. And we need people in the body of Christ who will devote themselves, commit themselves to a deep commitment to prayer. Third reason we need people who will serve in prayer, and this is hugely important, is the lack of prayer destroys families, churches, and nations. The lack of prayer destroys families, churches, and and nations. Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 30 and 31. God speaking, I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me in the land that I should not destroy it. He says, I, I need to destroy this land. But he says, I couldn't find one person who would stand in the breach, who would call out to me, who'd seek my face. Therefore, I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have returned their way upon their heads, declares the Lord God. There needs to be in the body of Christ some servants who are deeply committed to giving themselves to prayer. And nothing will shake them from that. Nothing will shake them from that. It's so written deeply, so written so deeply in their souls that they will miss other things, but they will not miss prayer because they've got the call of God on their life and they recognize it and they know it. And they give themselves to serving the church in prayer. Second Chronicles 7 and verse number 14, if my people are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal them. You want a healthy nation? Do you want a healthy nation? Do you want a healthy province? Do you want a healthy city? Oh, yeah, of course, Pastor. Well, you pray. Oh, no, I, I, I've got other things that are more important. This is how we bring health into our communities, into our churches, into our nation. And so I invite you, friends, I plead with you, I beg with you, please rise up, church, and let's get serious about serving God in prayer. I say this kindly with a heart full of love towards this church. But 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I could call this church to prayer a couple of times a day, and we'd have 40 to 50 people gathering in circles and crying out to God. And somehow that has diminished in our priorities in the last decade, oh, Holy Spirit, do the work here. Call up a group of people who will be committed to establishing a firm and solid foundation of prayer in the life and work of the neighborhood church. And so this weekend is a weekend of prayer and fasting. Uh, 7 p.m. Friday, we'll be meeting in Warman. And for those of you who think church is only church, if there's a guitar there, we'll have a guitar there. On a Saturday morning, we'll be meeting here in this sanctuary to cry out to God. We need to cry out to God. So the first area I'm challenging us to serve in is in this area of prayer. Save people, serve people, and one of the callings that will rest on people's hearts and lives, one of the ways you can serve is by giving herself to the place and to the ministry of prayer. The second way uh, you can serve is in children's ministry. In children's ministry. Why would I want to do that? Well, let me give you some reasons. Number one, children are a priority to God. 
children really matter to Jesus? And if children really matter to Jesus, then children have to really matter to the neighborhood church. Disciples were trying to keep the children away from Jesus. And Jesus' response to that, uh, Matthew 19, 14, is, come on, guys, <laughs> you're missing something here. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Children are precious in God's eyes. And because children are, in preci are precious in God's eyes, they must be, they must be precious to us. Second reason serving in children's ministry is such a beautiful thing is children's ministry impacts generations. Psalm chapter 78, Pastor Yasmin uh, preached on this uh, just before in our summer Psalter series. By the way, she's having a good sabbatical. Uh, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth at a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He's established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children. Children matter in the kingdom of God. Uh, children, and, and we see this, see this twice in this point, portion, uh, the reality that gener the ne generation matters, coming generation is in there, the next generation is there, tell them to your children. When you invest in children, you are creating a legacy that will outlive you. When you invest in children, you're creating a legacy that will outlive you. Third reason children's ministry needs to matter to us is because most people come to Christ for salvation when they're young. Most people come to Christ for salvation when they're young. Barna reports this in interviewing adult Christians. Only 6% of adult Christians made their decision to follow God over the age of 18. That means 94% of people following Christ as adults made their decisions to do so as children. Children need to matter to us. Children need to matter to us. You go into a grocery store, 50,000 square feet, groceries everywhere. You walk down the aisles. You only need a few things, but you have to do a lot of walking to find those few things. And this great, big, huge store, you get to the end, and there's only two cashiers on duty and the automatic teller. So you go and take your crackers and put them under there, and it goes beep, beep. And then it starts saying, assistance required, assistance required, assistance required. So you take your crackers because nobody's coming to help you and you go get in a line of 14 people waiting to get through the two cashiers. And you leave with your five items in this 50. 50,000 square feet store that is spotless and the shelves are fully stocked and you say when you get in the car that was poor customer poor customer service 
And so we build magnificent buildings to worship in. We invest in sound systems and buy comfortable chairs. And somebody comes to our church with a three-year-old And in the middle of the sermon, the three-year-old is getting a little restless, and they kind of figure it out because there's nobody in the foyer to help them where to take their kids, and they get to the nursery, and they look in the door, and there's uh, 20 kids running around the nursery and two adults, and she says, I'm not putting my kid in there. I wonder how many families have been lost to the cause of Christ because we haven't looked after their kids well. You see, <laughs> if, you, if you build this 50,000 square foot uh, grocery store and and you do a, a survey and, and you find out that the primary people who are, are gonna be shopping at your store are people under the age of 18. You don't stack that store with canes and wheelchairs and Gorilla Grip bath mats and Geritol. because kids under the age of 18 don't need those things. 94% of people who come to Christ in the church come to Christ under the age of 18. It has to be a priority of the people of God. So we need people. We need people who will stand up and and serve and serve in children's ministry. Save people. Thank you, Paul. Save people, serve people. Friends, if you get this, it'll change your life. If you get this, it'll change your life. It'll change your spirituality. It'll change your marriage. Husbands, I challenge you to go up to your wife and ask her, how can I serve you? Trust me, she'll tell you. Probably after you pick her up off the floor. But when a marriage is built on serving, the marriage thrives. You want your career to thrive? You want to get ahead at work? I tell you what to do. Start serving your employer. They're not looking for somebody to take advantage of them. They're not looking for somebody who will work four hours a day and complain because the checks aren't big enough yet. They're looking for people who will serve. You want to get ahead in your career. Develop the spirit of serving. Save people. Serve people. And that certainly needs to be a characteristic of the church. Our future... Our future as a church depends on us getting this wonderful revelation of the importance of all finding of all of us finding our place a place to serve. Got so much more to say, but I'm not going to say it tonight because I think one of the ways we serve is by actually being kind and friendly and talking to people around hot dogs. That's part of serving. But I do want to say a couple more things. I went to seminary. 
I spent some significant dollars getting a Master of Arts in Historical Theology. Had some classes with Dean Height. I learned under some brainiacs who used words, I didn't have a clue what they meant, but they wrote commentaries that were in the seminary library. But truthfully now, some 15 years later, I have to get into my files to remember any of their names. But I do remember Mr. Dick, Hank Dick, who taught my Sunday school class when I was eight to nine and 10 years old. I was always prepared and always friendly. And when I came into church, always made me feel really special. And two or three or four Saturdays a year, it was an all boys class. He'd say, guys, let's get together Saturday. And we went hiking or played ball or went skating or went out to eat together. I still remember Hank Dick's name. Investing in children makes a huge difference. I remember Mr. Cunningham. He became my Sunday school teacher when I got too old for Mr. Dick to teach anymore. He was the first guy in my life who hired me to do a job and actually gave me money for it. He did that as part of discipleship. When we invest in kids, friends, we're making an impact that gets passed on to generations. And the smart church recognizes that 94% of people who are in the church came to Christ while they were kids, so they are still deeply involved and invested in kids. I'm asking you this evening to <laughs> recognize that saved people serve people. And I'm asking you to all all of you to grab a connect card even now. I see you all reaching forward. Good, thank you. And on the back of that, there's a place where you can put your name. Friends, we have a children's pastor who can serve us and will serve us very, very well. But she can't do it alone. We have a toddler's nursery that needs people in it every single service. That's kids under two and a half years of age. We need in the preschool nursery, two and a half to five people who will work in it every single week. We don't expect anybody to be up there all the time. And the more people will say, yeah, I'll get involved, the better off it is for us. And friends, did you hear what Victor said? A, he felt connected when he started to serve. Had people painting together this week, and they says, Bob, this is great. I met some new people. One of the greatest ways to get connected is to begin to serve. It's an opportunity here to serve and Around here, friends, you don't have to be in your 40s to serve. If you're in grade seven, eight, nine, grade five, grade, we need people to serve. And I'm just inviting you to, to take your card and say, I'm willing to get into a rotation and helping in children's ministry. Put your name on it, just write that on there, and, and we'll get involved. And it doesn't need to be that difficult. You see, husbands and wives can do this together. Fathers and daughters can do this together. Mothers and sons can do this together. And if enough of us step up and say, I'm willing to serve, guess what? Many hands make the... Yeah, that too. Save people, serve people. Um, 
So, pastor to church. Couldn't get anybody in children's ministry. Church was growing. And I put out a challenge, and I said to every couple, it wasn't a small church, I said to every couple, why won't you consider working in the nursery? We got so many signed up <laughs> that every couple worked in the nursery twice in the year. Just twice, with morning services, evening services. Just twice, because everybody said, kids matter around here. And friends, let's be crystal clear. Kids matter at the neighborhood church because kids matter to Jesus. Kids matter at the neighborhood church because most people who come to Christ come to Christ as children. So fill out your Connect cards. In about 30 seconds, the ushers are going to come forward and pass the plate and, uh, and collect the Connect cards. And those of you who are able to help with children's ministry, bless you. Uh, Pastor Karen will get a hold of you. The other, the other part of this, and we need people to help, by the way, on the soundboard upstairs. There's all kinds of areas we need help with. And remember, we need people who will commit themselves to pray as well. So as the ushers come forward, I want us to go to John chapter 12 and verse 26. I think this is a great verse. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Did you just, and, and just pass the plates right down the rows and let the people uh, have an opportunity to, to put their connect cards in. John chapter 12, verse 26. Did you notice who God honors here? Did you notice it? Did you catch it? I will honor anyone who hasn't sinned in a big way. Is that what it says? I will honor anyone who was a virgin when they got married. Is that what it says? I will honor anyone who didn't party hardy on spring break. I will honor anyone who belongs to the New Democratic Party. No. <laughs> who does God honor? Anyone who serves me, the Father will honor. Do you want the honor of God resting on your life? I crave for it. I crave for it. Do you want the honor of God resting on your life? Serve. Because save people, serve people. One lasting verse as Pastor Jordan comes to pray the benediction. Matthew, don't we all long for this to be what Jesus says to us when we stand before him? Well done, good and faithful servant. Save people. Serve people. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll set, you, uh, I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Save people. Serve people. God bless you. Well, thank you so much for joining us at the Neighborhood Church. We hope it's been a meaningful and blessed time for you. Thank you, Pastor John, for such a good word. And I just want to encourage each one of us. Everyone has a place to serve. Uh, we're looking to fill many ministry opportunities. So if you feel God nudging you to something, fill out your Connect card, call the office, chat with us. We'd love to plug you in. We'd love to get you on one of our ministry teams. As always, I'm going to end by saying we've had church. Now let's go be the church. God bless you. Have a great week.